Hello, friends. This is the Neatarts Friends Church podcast. We are Jesus people, kingdom of God people, welcoming, yearning, sharing. And we're glad you're connecting here with us. We'd love to connect in person as well. If you're inclined to support this podcast or for more information, just hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. That's neatartsfriends.org. Let's jump into today's sermon. When we come to God, we come as far as we can. And there's an asterisk on that statement. We come as far as we think we can come. We come as far as we want to come sometimes. We come as far as we were told that we could come. We come as far as we are able to come. And with every time we come to God, whatever that looks like, there's a story. There are reasons that we're coming this far and not farther. So I was mulling this over this past week. I was driving down the road listening to the radio and a song came on by the artist Jelly Roll, God, I Need a Favor. And so I was listening to this song and found myself thinking about how this song is such a picture of people in our contemporary culture, uh, our human experience, and the characters in our gospel story this week. For those of you who know this song, I've edited out some of the colorful language. Here it is. I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So who am I? Who am I to expect a savior? If I only talk to God when I need a favor. But God, I need a favor. I know amazing grace, but I ain't been living them words. Swear I spend more Sundays drunk than I have in church. Hardcover King James, only been saving dust on the nightstand. And I don't know what to say by the time I fold my hands. Yeah, I owe you more than one, and beggars can't be choosers. But I'll pay for all I've done. Just please don't let me lose her. I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So who am I? Who am I to expect a savior? If I only talk to God when I need a favor. But God, I need a favor. Amen. Those are the lyrics of the song. There's a desperation. There's an honesty in this song that sounds to me so much like the characters we find in our gospel story this week. When we show up searching and hungry and looking for Jesus, we know we're bringing a history. We know we're bringing a mess with us. We come with our very human problems, lives, and relationships that need help. We come with all of our humanity, the good, the bad, the ugly, Some of us come and we don't even know all the reasons that we're showing up. We come as far as we can come. And we hope against hope that Jesus will do what we cannot, will help what we cannot, will heal what we cannot. We all come as far as we can come and we reach out in desperation. God, I need a favor. This brings us to our gospel story, Luke chapter 6, starting in verse 12. Some of this is going to sound like a repeat, just so you aren't surprised. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he also designated apostles. There was Simon, who he named Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. Jesus went down with them 
and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem and from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. We come as far as we can come. Notice the characters in our gospel story. It includes many disciples who traveled with Jesus up the mountain to pray. Out of that group, there is, of course, the A-team, the apostles, the 12 who Jesus chose. But then there are also many disciples who didn't travel up the mountain with Jesus to pray. For whatever reason, they remained in the lowlands, in the valley. And then there are also crowds who came from as far as 100 miles away to hear Jesus and be healed. But they didn't travel up the mountain with Jesus to pray. They remained also in the lowlands, in the valley. And... Notice not everyone is able to make it to the mountaintop with Jesus to pray. Some people throw their prayers of desperation out from the darkest valleys, the lowlands. Their prayers are a lot more like the Jelly Roll song. It's, God, I need a favor. And not everyone even knows all the reasons that they've shown up, especially except for what they've heard about Jesus and the mess that they see in their own life and the mess they see in their world, and it sounds like Jesus might be able to help. Can you see the different groups of people in the gospel story? We all come as far as we can. So what's the big deal with the mountains in this gospel story? Well, In ancient Jewish thought, mountains weren't just geographical features. They held meaning. They held significance. New Testament scholar and early church historian Dale Allison Jr. says, In the Gospels, geographical facts are vehicles of literary and theological ideas. Most of the mountains in the Gospels carry theological meaning. So, in in our day, you might travel over the coastal range in a little over an hour, depending on traffic. You've been to the mountaintop, but the way you probably say it is very casual, like, oh, I went over the hill. It's no big deal. It doesn't mean anything. But in ancient Jewish thought, you didn't casually say, I went up a mountain, because to go up a mountain was a picture of spiritual pilgrimage. It was seeking God. The presence of Yahweh was frequently associated with mountains. Mountains held significance because they were the place where God revealed God's self. The Hebrew scriptures were full of deeply meaningful mountaintop stories. There's Mount Moriah, Mount Nebo, Mount Carmel, Mount Sinai, Mount Zion. These mountaintop stories were stories of revelation, epiphanies, theophanies, elation, ultimately salvation history. What does God do to save the world? So think Martin Luther King declaring, I've been to the mountaintop, I've looked over, I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. There's this significance there, mountaintop. We all come as far as we can come, but not all of us make it to the mountaintop, or at least we don't think we can make it to the mountaintop. The mountaintop is where all the God stuff happens. It's where people actually hear from God and experience something transcendent and transforming. But the mountaintop isn't where people live. It's not where real life 
happens. We all wish life was a big long string of mountaintop experiences, but for most people it isn't real life. Real life for most people is in the lowlands. It's in the valleys. Even if Sunday was incredible, you have to turn around and face life on Monday. The valley experiences are struggle and hardship and stress and anxiety and loneliness and dysfunction and brokenness, pain, loss, uncertainty, plain old exhaustion. We all come as far as we can come. So a discussion question here, uh, or if you're just listening on your own, a reflection question. Describe a mountaintop experience. There's no need to justify why you think of this as a mountaintop experience. Simply describe what it was like. So take a moment and reflect on that. A critic can always look at someone coming to Jesus in the lowlands, someone who hasn't traveled with Jesus up the mountain to pray, and criticize them. For instance, they could criticize the artist Jelly Roll in his song, God, I Need a Favor. And they could say, well, what you need to do is wipe the dust off that King James. You need to get rid of the bottle. You need to get your butt in church. You need to live them words. You should stop swearing while you're at it. They could say that kind of stuff. And, and while there might be a kernel of truth in their criticism, that's a small view. It doesn't see the entire picture it doesn't see the entire person. It doesn't see the healing that is needed the most. And it doesn't see how incredible it is that they are here, that they are praying at all. There are usually reasons that we come as far as we come, and they're often complex. There are probably reasons the person in the song only talks to God when he needs a favor. There are reasons that some people who came to Jesus didn't travel up the mountain with him. So we're going to unpack that and explore that part of our gospel story. So Luke tells us that in the lowlands, in the valley, there were a great number of people from all over Judea and Jerusalem and from the coast of Tyre and Sidon had come to hear Jesus and be healed of their diseases. Now, the question that occurs to me is, why would anyone from the coast of Tyre and Sidon want to travel, want to walk 40 to 60 miles to hear and see a Jewish rabbi? So let me give you a little background here. Josephus the Jewish historian called the people of Tyre our most bitter enemy. He's speaking for the Jewish people there when he says Tyre is our most bitter enemy. Tyre and Sidon were code for pagan land, code for everything dangerous to the faith of Israel. Their history was one of exploiting people and hoarding wealth and hoarding food and always at the expense of poorer areas like Galilee, where Jesus was from. They were the wealthy and godless oppressor of Israel. One of the Bible's most famous villains, Queen Jezebel, came from Tyre. So if you look up what the Old Testament, the prophets, had to say about Tyre and Sidon, it isn't a pretty picture. The prophet Isaiah wrote about Tyre being destroyed and Sidon being crushed. 
The prophet Jeremiah wrote about Tyre and Sidon drinking the wine of God's wrath, becoming slaves of King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon, and punishing them with the sword and famine and plague if they wouldn't serve King Nebuchadnezzar, cutting them off from any help. The prophet Ezekiel wrote about Tyre and Sidon sinking into the heart of the sea, coming to a horrible end, and being no more. The prophet Joel wrote about Tyre and Sidon, God paying them back for what they had done. The prophet Amos wrote about God sending fire against the walls of Tyre. The prophet Zechariah wrote about the Lord taking away Tyre and Sidon's possessions and destroying her power on the sea and consuming her with fire. So once again, the question, why? Why would anyone on the coast of Tyre and Sidon want to travel 40 to 60 miles to hear a Jewish rabbi teach, much less become Jesus' disciple. Now, most likely, we don't have the complete answer to this question, but Luke has already given us a clue in Luke chapter 4, and it has to do with the mission that Jesus declared and the way that Jesus kicked his entire ministry off in his hometown of Nazareth. So if you are if you did not get to see the sermon, Apologies You Need But Might Not Ever Receive, that is the sermon that will give you the background on that uh, the Nazareth story. So in the synagogue of Nazareth, on the Sabbath, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, read and edited Isaiah 61. Isaiah 61 was one of the famous passages about the day of the Lord's vengeance. The Hebrew prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Micah, Nahum all wrote explicitly about the day of the Lord's vengeance against Israel's enemies, i.e. Tyre and Sidon. And so, In Nazareth, Jesus declared the year of the Lord's favor while simultaneously omitting the day of the Lord's vengeance, the part of that scripture that everyone knew. They're like waiting for Jesus to read it. He omits it. He leaves it out. He edits the passage and he opens the year of the Lord's favor to Israel's enemies. And then Jesus went on to reference the prophet Elijah not being sent to any of the widows in Israel, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. Aha! Immediately the synagogue turned into a lynch mob and tried to kill Jesus on the spot. Now, news about Jesus had already been spreading around the entire countryside, but how could news like this not spread like wildfire? Here was a Jewish rabbi interpreting scripture differently, radically, healing people, making people, especially powerful, power broker people, mad enough to try to kill him. That sounds like the kind of news that spreads far and wide. So why would anyone from the coast of Tyre and Sidon want to walk 40 to 60 miles to hear a Jewish rabbi teach? I wonder how many of them from Tyre and Sidon had heard about the Jewish rabbi Jesus who was declaring the year of the Lord's favor for them and using one of their own, a widow from Sidon, as an image of those who receive God's favor. And I also wonder, what did the disciples who went up the mountain with Jesus to pray, what did they think when Jesus went down the mountain and he stood with these people from Tyre and Sidon, these people who the prophets had said were under God's vengeance and under God's wrath? Like, these people aren't supposed to be here, but here they were, coming as far as they could come. And the disciples found Jesus standing with them. 
They were bringing Jesus their very human struggles, and Jesus was giving them healing and wholeness. Were some of Jesus' disciples waiting to see if Jesus would just kind of ignore them, ignore the people from Tyre and Sidon, not acknowledge the significance that they were from Tyre and Sidon? How did Jesus, as the full and complete revelation of God, the final word of God, interpret and fulfill what Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Joel, Amos, Zechariah had written about Tyre and Sidon? Well, it's fascinating to read what Jesus has to say in the Gospels about Tyre and Sidon, where the Old Testament, I just gave you that overview about Tyre and Sidon, it's entirely negative. The New Testament is entirely positive. Rather than Jesus describing Tyre and Sidon as an object of God's vengeance or wrath on foreigners, Jesus used Tyre and Sidon as a positive example of repentance. He didn't deny the reality of judgment, but he spoke of the judgment of Tyre and Sidon in positive terms. It will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon on the Day of Judgment than the Jewish villages of Chorazin and Bethsaida. I can't help thinking that when Jesus said this, he was thinking about the crowds who came to him from Tyre and Sidon in the lowlands, in the valley, these people who came as far as they could. Jesus used Tyre and Sidon as a place of rest and retreat from the onslaught of critics, from the Pharisees and the teachers of the law who wanted to argue with him and trap him and plot against him. Jesus affirmed the faith of a widow in Sidon, and the rest of the New Testament witness doesn't have a single negative thing to say about the people of Tyre and Sidon. Jesus went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there, a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coastal region around Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him and be healed of their diseases. Those troubled by impure spirits were cured. The people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. What does this mean that Jesus comes down the mountain to stand in the lowlands with you, with people who've come as far as they can come? How many people in our world are coming to Jesus just like the people of Tyre and Sidon came to Jesus? We all come as far as we can come. How many people aren't traveling up the mountain with Jesus to pray? There's nothing high and holy about their way of coming to Jesus. They don't feel worthy. They don't feel welcome or even capable of a mountaintop experience. They have too much painful history. They've done too many things. They've heard too many messages telling them that God is against them. Whatever their reason, they come to Jesus in the lowlands. I only talk to God when I need a favor. They come with problems and messes and history and struggle. They throw up prayers like the Jelly Roll song. I only talk to God when I need a favor. I only pray when I ain't got a prayer. So who am I? Who am I to expect a savior if I only talk to God when I need a favor? But God, I need a favor. Jesus could speak to the worst, to those in the lowlands, those with a twisted history and messed up life, asking for a favor. He could tell them they don't even understand the first thing about prayer. But that's not what Jesus does. Jesus sees something else in them. It isn't that he's ignoring the way that sin infects us all like a toxin. It isn't that he's ignoring the healing that they need, but Jesus sees what is best, what is beautiful in them. They are here. 
out of all the places in the world that they could have chosen to be today, out of all the things that they could have chosen to do today, they are here, standing in the lowlands. They're hungry. They're needy. They're searching. They've come as far as they can come. And they need a release from the inevitability of doing what they've always done, a release from life and this world being the way it's always been. To those crying out, God, I need a favor, Jesus declares more than a favor. His mission is the favor of God. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he's anointed me to proclaim good news, gospel to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The early church father, Ambrose of Milan, wrote about Jesus descending to the lowly. He says, note all things carefully. He ascends, that means he goes up with the apostles, and he descends He goes down to the crowds. How would a crowd see Christ except at a low level? It does not follow him to the heights. It does not climb to majestic places. So when he descends, he finds the weak, for the weak cannot be high up. Thus also Matthew teaches that the weak were healed down below. First each was healed so that little by little, with increasing virtue, he could ascend to the mountain. On the plain, he heals each. That is, he calls them back from recklessness. He turns away the harm of blindness. He descends to heal our wounds, so that in an effective and abundant manner, he makes us partakers in his heavenly nature. The Apostle Paul says it this way, What does he ascended mean? Except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions. He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. My friend Sherry Nozick says, Jesus is Jesus on the mountaintop and in the valley. All he has is all ours, always. His generosity never corrupts us or belittles us. It challenges us, it heals us, it invites us. We all come as far as we can come, and Jesus meets us. He stands with us. He heals our deepest wounds and illnesses. He teaches us. He interprets and fulfills scripture, proclaims the year of the Lord's favor over us. He journeys with us, not to become who we think we need to become, or who other people think we need to become. He journeys with us so that we might become who we were created to be, who he has known us to be all along, people created in the image of God. The Jesus of the mountaintop is the Jesus of the valley. What does this mean to you today? What does it mean that however far you think you can make it, Jesus comes and stands with you and journeys with you from that point? What does it mean to ask for a favor and receive the favor of God? What does it mean to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus who invites you to journey up the mountain to pray and invites you down the mountain to stand with those the prophets have said are under God's vengeance and wrath, but you watch these people bring their human struggles to Jesus and you watch Jesus give them healing and wholeness. What does it mean to come to Jesus? for the healing and the wholeness that you need.
Thank you for joining us for a Sunday sermon from Neatart's Friends Church. We hope you'll join us soon for one of our in-person worship gatherings. For more information, hop on over to neatartsfriends.org. God's peace be with you, friends.